Well, you're most welcome to this talk. Now, I want to look at the contribution made by Mr. Danny Kruger, the Member of Parliament, to the excess debate that was in the UK Parliament a couple of days ago, which was remarkably poorly attended. Some might say outrageously and disgracefully poorly attended. Now, I've put a couple of links on, one to the original video and also to this site here. Now, this is called uh, Hansard, and here we get the full transcript of all the... Uh, goings on in all the parliamentary rooms and debates i just want to give you a few links to what mr kruger was saying and then i'll, I'll play let him speak for himself um so this is directly from hansard we know by all the different measures that many more people are dying now than were before the pandemic this is not a debate and yet it's not top of the political agenda it's not top of the news agenda it's utterly bizarre the, uh, the, the deafening silence on this matter. In particular, Mr Kruger goes on, the impact on people's hearts and increasingly younger people's hearts deserves attention. Heart disease in the younger and middle-aged age groups is remarkably concerning and I know from your feedback that many of you have been touched by tragedy from this. Mr Kruger again. The British Heart Foundation reported last June that since the start of the pandemic, 100,000 more people have died than would have been expected. That is surely significant, a surely significant cause for us to take this question seriously. And yet, so many people just seem to be ignoring it. We know that there are adverse events from the vaccine. Everybody acknowledges that. It is a question of the extent to which those effects have been manifest. Yes, there's adverse events. Is it a small problem? Is it an international scandal? It could be anywhere between those two. Mr Kruger. I'm afraid that the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, MHRA, is significantly deficient in the way it operates. Pretty strong words. Mr Kruger again. The Cumberledge Report, this was referenced in the earlier debate, raise concerns about the way treatments are regulated and licensed that have not yet been addressed. So he's got concerns about the way that treatments are regulated and licensed, and this is me speaking now. I'm also concerned that many treatments that would be effective, such as those developed by Professor Clancy and Professor Dalglish, are being ignored. Or, worse still, in the case of Professor Dalglish's uh, preparation, that perhaps reduces all for many forms of cancer and all many forms of infection, uh, refused licensing for compassionate use by the MHRA. So the, are they passing things that they shouldn't be passing? Are they, uh, oh, what's the word? Um, I wouldn't like to use too strong a word. Uh, are, are they uh, forgetting to, or, or somehow omitting to use potentially efficacious treatments that could potentially save my life or your life? Surely not. Mr Kruger again. I'm afraid that through the COVID episode, many of the same concerns were manifest in related to the vaccines. The regulatory system that oversees the pharmaceutical companies is surely deeply conflicted, not least, to during, not least due to being partly funded by the pharmaceutical companies that it was set up to represent, and in fact, the majority of funding comes from uh, pharmaceutical and other vested uh, industry interests. Mr Kruger again. It is significant and of concern that they have made so much money out of the vaccines and so far do not appear to be making due rep recompense for some of the acknowledged harms. So there's acknowledged harms that aren't debated, surely, the vaccine companies that have made so much money from this should step up, do the right thing and say, look, let's help with your treatment here. I haven't heard of a single case. Mr Kruger again, the inquiry, that's the COVID inquiry in the UK, has been mentioned. There are so many unanswered questions and apparent red flags that it surprises me that the media and parliament are not more up in arms about excess deaths. I'm surprised that more attention is not being paid to this question. It's almost as if it's being deliberately suppressed. Sorry, that was me talking there. Back to Mr Kruger. Uh, the fact is that this scandal, if it is a scandal, suits no one in high places in our country. Suits no one in high places in our country. Now, surely elites aren't covering this up for their own benefit, but 
Mr. Kruger there. The fact is that this scandal, if it is a scandal, suits no one in high places in our country. The operational rollout of uh, the operational rollout of the vaccines was a victory that all people can acknowledge. In that, he means it was. I think he means it was impressive logistics. Uh, of course, money was being made, but it was still impressive logistics. Uh, but it's not enough to say that the rollout was well done. Was it done safely? Did it need to be done on the scale in which it was done? Particularly, did young people need to be vaccinated at all? These questions are increasingly being asked by the public and raised in the media. Well, the media is not too interested with some exceptions. Um, I mean, we could, we could go on. Um, we asked specifically, this is Mr Kruger, what is the evidence for the definitive statement about safety and efficacy? The government said there is no evidence linking uh, excess deaths to the vaccine, but the government aren't offering evidence that they're safe either. Mr Kruger says, if so, that's great news, but we, but we have the evidence, but may we have the evidence on which this assertion is based? Will the Department for Health and the MHRA and the UK Health Security Agency release the data that's needed to understand what is going on? The data that we're asking for is already made available to privately pharmaceutical companies, to private, ph private pharmaceutical companies. So they've got the data. Companies for them to use in their safety studies of the vaccine. You know, I wonder if Mr. Kruger's being a bit over exacting here. I mean, the pharmaceutical companies have got this data. Surely we can trust them to tell us if there's any red flags, can't we? Surely. The data you're asking for is already made available to the pharmaceutical companies for them to use in their safety studies of the vaccine. Oh, but then he asks, why do they get it, but not the public? Yeah, that's a good question. Why do pharmaceutical companies get it, but not the public? Why is that, this safety data? Mr Kruger, why can't... It indi why can't why cannot independent scientists look at that data? Because they can't, because we're not giving it. We're treated like mushrooms here. Mr Kruger again. I'm sorry to say that we had replies to neither that letter, which was written in February, here we are in April, nor after months to freedom of information requests that went to the agencies. We're just asking for the data. We've got the epidemiologists, we've got the statisticians waiting for this data who can do the analysis. Anyway, over to Mr Kruger in Parliament now. Do give him the chance, some pretty powerful points. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge the work and the speech made by the member for North West Leicestershire. And I please don't start cheering because the uh, Deputy Speaker will close the debate. Um, but it is not popular on our benches, but I think we have an obligation to take what he says seriously and to examine the evidence that he's brought and he has an absolute right to make the case that he does in this place and I just lastly before I get on to my point my friend from Basildon here made the essential point we need more evidence and I fundamentally think what we need to do and I implore the minister to respond to this point in her wind up we need the government to be more open and to instruct the agencies of the government uh, the regulator and the health service to provide the data that we need to get to the bottom of this question just to disagree with the member from North West Leicestershire, I think, he suggests that there's some fishy business going on with the way the ONS calculates excess deaths in recent years. And who knows, maybe there is. But I think it was the right decision that the ONS took to uh, change the methodology. Uh, as Carl Hennigan and others have pointed out, there was the previous me method of accounting for excess deaths, of taking an average over five years, actually led to an exaggeration of excess death numbers during the pandemic and, in a sense, contributed to the to the great anxiety that people had, which encouraged the lockdown. So I think it's right to rethink how excess deaths have been calculated. We do know by all the different measures that uh, many more people are dying now than they were before the pandemic. And that might be accounted for simply by an aging population, by long COVID itself, uh, or the effects of the NHS under pressure. But as we've heard today, Madam Deputy Speaker, there is significant evidence that other factors are at play, and particularly the impact on, uh, on people's hearts and, and increasingly younger people's hearts, I think deserve attention. The British Heart Foundation reporting last June that 100,000 
more people have died than, you, than would be expected uh, since the start of the pandemic is surely a significant cause for us to take this question seriously. So the question raised by the Honourable Member for, from North West Leicestershire is whether the vaccines have contributed to, these, to this increase in, in excess deaths. And now I, I hesitate to wade into this debate because I'm not a scientist. I recognise the point made by, by others, and I think particularly by the Member for Blackley just now, that science and politics are uncomfortable bedfellows. We know there are adverse effects from the vaccination. Everybody acknowledges that. It's just a question of what, to what extent those, uh, those effects have been manifested. But my particular concern, and it goes back to my point about the request for evidence, is whether the system that we have that oversees the licensing, the regulation, the monitoring, the analysis of, the, uh, of, of medical treatments in general, and vaccines in particular, is up to scratch. And we all have, there's so much speculation in this debate about what is going on and what, 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 what is true and what isn't. But then we do seem to have some facts that all, we can all agree on. The first, I'm afraid, being that the MHRA is significantly deficient in the way it operates. The Cumberland report, and it was referenced in the debate, uh, in the earlier debate, raised concerns about the way treatments are uh, regulated and licensed that have not yet been addressed. And I'm afraid to say through the COVID episode, many of the same concerns were manifested in relation to these, uh, to these vaccines. We know that the MHRA, we now know, that they knew about the effect of uh, the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine in terms of clotting, blood clotting, as early as February 2021, but they only issued a warning about this some months later uh, in April, which is a month after other countries had suspended the, uh, the AZ vaccine. MHRA also knew about the, uh, the, the prevalence of heart problems and myocarditis in February 2021, but they did nothing about it until June of that year, in which, in, in, in the intervening time, millions of people uh, were vaccinated without the knowledge that the MHRA had. We now know, recently, and the point, point has been made, that Pfizer uh, misrepresented the safety and efficacy of the vaccine. There's been very little comeback against them for this. No meaningful <coughs> fines, just as we've heard, just a few thousand pounds charged them in expenses. And the regulatory system that oversees these pharmaceutical companies it surely is deeply conflicted, not least by the fact that they are partly funded by the pharmaceutical companies that they are set up to represent. And I think it is significant and of concern that uh, they have made so much money out of these vaccines and then so far do not appear to be making due recompense for some of these acknowledged harms. I'm not talking about the wilder claims, the acknowledged harms that, uh, that their vaccines have been responsible for. And I wonder, and I wonder, and I wonder if it's something that the Minister could perhaps enlighten us on. The indemnity that the government awarded to the vaccine manufacturers at the beginning of the uh, production process, whether those indemnities still apply if it transpires that the company is misled the government and the public about the safety and efficacy of their product. So are they still indemnified against uh, civil action, against government action, if it turns out that the public and the government were misled about the, the safety of their product? The inquiry has been mentioned, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and it does strike me there are so many unanswered questions, so many apparent red flags in this question that it is, does surprise me that the media and, the, and Parliament are not more up in arms about, uh, about excess deaths. I, I'm surprised we do not have more attention being paid to this question. But the fact is that this scandal, if it is a scandal, it suits no one in high places in our country. We do have an inquiry, it is true. But as the Honourable Member opposite just said, surely it's asking the wrong questions. And it's very concerning that the module looking at the, at the vaccination programme has now been... Uh, has, has been postponed. It strikes me that the inquiry is essentially asking the wrong questions. It's really just asking why we didn't do more lockdowns quicker. That seems to be its prevailing uh, question for us uh, and for its experts. Not the question about whether the whole response was the right one. Uh, and now, crucially, in light of what we now know, was the final response of, the, of a mass vaccination programme, was that as safe and effective as it was claimed? And of course, we are rightly proud in this country of the effectiveness, the speed, the operation of the vaccine production and rollout. It's a triumph of effective 
uh, collaboration between government and the private sector. The, the operations of the rollout were a, a victory that all people can, be, can acknowledge. But it is not enough to say that the rollout was done well. Was it done safely? Did it need to be done at all on the scale that it was done? Because particularly, did young people need to be vaccinated at all? And we all remember Kate Bingham and others saying early on that this vaccine was only for the older population. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, these questions are increasingly being, art, being asked by the public and being raised in the media. Um, and just to quickly conclude with what I've been doing, and I hope we might get some more answers from the Minister than I've had so far from the, from the, from the government. On the, on the 17th of April, literally a year ago, yesterday is that, uh, 2023, I wrote privately to the Secretary of State um, asking for evidence that justified the assertion that the government was making that there was no link between the vaccines and the excess deaths. And I did that because I had so much correspondence from people saying, raising this concern. And, and I, said, I, I, I can quickly quote my, part of my letter. I said, I said to the Secretary of State, I'm writing privately in this way rather than raising the question in Parliament because I'm determined not to give credence to unscientific conspiratorial accusations nor to undermine the vaccination programme in public if it is indeed entirely safe and effective. <coughs> So I didn't want to do this in public because I wanted to give the, government, give the government the opportunity to give me the evidence that I could then pass back to constituents. But I'm afraid the, the reply I received from the minister was, was the one that we've heard already, is this bland assertion that there's, like, there's probably a combination of factors, flu and, uh, and, and old age and so on, that accounts for the excess deaths. Um, and the rest of the letter was all about what the government is doing to combat excess deaths. And the answer to that was more vaccines. Uh, mostly. Um, so uh, there we go. So I don't think that was good enough. It's taken a year rolled by. The, the evidence seemed to mount. More and more people raising this concern. So I joined with the Honourable Member and others, including the Member for Shipley, who couldn't be here today, but wanted me to explain that he was on important constituency business, but very much is here in spirit. The Member for Shipley, for Blackley and others, and I, um, we wrote a public letter this time to the government asking the same question in more detail and specifically, what is the evidence for the definitive statement about safety and efficacy? The government says, I quote, there is no evidence linking excess deaths to the vaccine. That is great news. If so, please could we have the evidence on which that assertion is made? Um, and secondly, we asked, will the Department for Health, the MHRA and the UK SHA, the Health Authority, re release the data that is needed to understand what is going on. This data that we are asking for is already made available privately to the pharmaceutical companies for them to use in their safety studies into the vaccine. Why do they get it? Why doesn't the public get it? Why can't independent scientists look at that data? And I'm sorry to say, Mr Deputy Speaker, we've had no reply to that letter, so I understand it, written in February, uh, and here we are in April. Nor indeed to freedom of information requests that went to uh, the agencies as well months after they were submitted. Well, we'll, we'll have to bring have to give it away. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I don't know the answer as to why uh, the government would not want to release the data. It may be that it, it would um, potentially be misused and misrepresented. One way around that potentially might be to invite uh, research applications from our very sophisticated research ecosystem that has that would then be given access to the data to be able with um, if they come forward with particular research projects access the data and then be able to uh, report on that with external verification that they have actually used the data that was supplied and not uh, drifted too far from that I'm, I'm very grateful, and I think that sort of pra practical suggestion should be, should be considered, and I'd be interested in the government's response to that. My view, actually, is that what we're asking for is anonymised data uh, that, that, that poses no risk to any individuals, um, and if it is open and public, then the whole purpose is that through the process of scientific interrogation and analysis, uh, it should not be possible to, be, to misuse it, and I think we need as much sunlight on this data as possible. So let me end by repeating what I hope we could get as a commitment from the front bench in this debate. Firstly, what I've been asking for, anonymised record level official mortality data, including vaccination status, the information that's already being shared with drug, co drug companies. That should be shared, in my view, with Parliament and the public. And if that is not possible, please could the Minister explain why not. Secondly, again, the sources for the government's definitive statement that it made most recently in October 2023, and I dare say might make again today, that there is no evidence of a link between the excess death figures and 
the COVID-19 vaccines. And Mr Deputy Speaker, I hope there is no leg. I took the vaccine, at least the first two jabs, um, as did most of my family, most of my constituents. I'm sure most people in the gallery took it. We all did. I really hope that the Honourable Member is wrong in asserting that there is this dangerous connection. I am very personally very reluctant to be branded a conspiracy theorist. I still don't want to give credence to uh, unscientific assertions. But we in this place are here to take risks, the risks of ridic ridicule and contempt, in exchange for the privileges we have of being here. And I think it is right that we raise the concerns on behalf of the public, even when there is some political cost. Too many people are dying and we have to understand why. Thank you. Yeah.